It's difficult to imagine how an ordinary person can get up and go for a long distance run that can last up to three days straight. But being able to endure such long distance runs is not an uncommon phenomenon. Some runners, called ultra marathoners, may run distances of five kilometers many times over in a single race. These runners are regular people that train hard in order to endure running 160 kilometers, if not several hundred kilometers at one given time. Despite not being good speed runners when compared to other non-human primates, trained endurance runners have the amazing ability of running ultra-long distances. But where did this running ability come from? To find out, we need to consider the evolutionary past and the selective pressures that might have taken place for endurance runners in early hominids. In the attempt to explain the modern human body form and long-distance running abilities in early hominids and in modern Homo sapiens, two hypotheses have surfaced in the literature. The first hypothesis is called the scavenging hypothesis, which has been around since the early 1980s. The scavenging model suggests that early hominids developed the ability to run long distances to access previously killed meat before other scavengers arrived. The evolutionary pressure to scavenge meat created a serious competition between early hominids and other scavengers like hyenas. Over time, such need to get the previously killed meat resulted in the improvement of endurance running capabilities. In 1984, two pivotal papers were published, one by David Carrier and colleagues and one by Walter Bortz. In these papers, the long-distance running hypothesis was first proposed, where they suggested that long-distance running was used by early hominids like Homo erectus around 2 million years ago to run down large game to exhaustion without the use of sophisticated weapons. This way of running down large animals is also known as persistence hunting. Although it may be possible to utilize walking to outpace a small ungulate on a hot day, the goal of persistence hunting is to run an animal down to exhaustion so that the animal keeps running at a trotting pace for long periods of time, where the animal is not allowed to rest. At this pace, the animal will eventually enter hyperthermia since it will not be able to keep itself cool by panting alone. At this point, the exhausted ungulate gives up running altogether and accepts his or her death. Unlike ungulates, early Homo is known to have had an increase in equine sweat glands as well as having a comparatively bare skin that allowed them to maintain a cooler body temperature in hot environments when running. I'll elaborate more on persistence hunting later in the video, but for now, just know that these two articles by Carrier and colleagues in Walter Boards first suggested that long distance running allowed early hominids to acquire higher quality and nutrient dense food, which is meat. Two prominent researchers named Dennis Bramble and Daniel Lieberman believe that endurance running was already being used in scavenging. Scavenging allowed early homo to develop the skill of persistence hunting which requires tracking skills and the ability to run long distances. Therefore, the scavenging hypotheses and the running hypotheses are complementary. Being locked into an evolutionary arms race with other scavengers such as hyenas eventually led early hominids to become efficient long distance runners. Over time, the early distance runners became efficient enough to use their running ability to run large game down to exhaustion via persistence hunting to access their animal protein. The running hypothesis remained dormant for about 20 years after it was first proposed due to lack of empirical evidence. Around the time, in the 80s, Carrier couldn't find any group of hunter-gatherers that were practicing persistence hunts because the hunter-gatherer groups he knew of had already adopted modern hunting methods such as hunting with rifles but also the evidence for persistence hunting was difficult to come by using archaeological methods because this practice leaves no traces in the fossil record. Other avenues for evidence were explored by Bramble and Lieberman in 2004 when they published a list of 26 distinct physical characteristics that were unique to long distance running in humans. Their findings provided evidence for the running hypothesis by suggesting that running evolved for a specific purpose as opposed to having been a byproduct of walking as many scholars argued. 
I will summarize only some of the unique physical characteristics that were unique to long distance running since each of the 26 characteristics that Bramble and Lieberman published can be a video of its own. Homo erectus, for example, had a taller and narrower body type than early hominids. This body type was bigger and more linear than previous hominids such as the Australopithecines and Paranthropines. A more linear body type served to regulate body heat in a hot, open environment more efficiently than a short, stout body type because the sun has a smaller target to heat up. A larger body type probably allowed early hominids to explore farther distances, allowing them to take advantage of a wider range of dietary niches. Homo erectus also had longer legs relative to their body size, shorter toes, and longer Achilles tendons than previous hominids. With longer legs, running hominids are able to take longer strides which improve long distance running speed over time. Shorter toes serve to stabilize the plantar flexion stride landing and longer Achilles tendons help save up to 50% of the metabolic cost that it takes to run long distances. Furthermore, a nuchal ligament, a more balanced head, and a short snout in the human skeleton serve to stabilize the head when running. Soon after Bramble and Lieberman published the 26 physical characteristics that were unique to long distance running in humans, Bramble received a phone call from an individual named Louis Liebenberg claiming that he could show how an antelope could be run down to death. This was one piece of the puzzle that Bramble and Carrier had been looking for since the running hypothesis was first proposed. In 1984, Carrier took on the same challenge by attempting to run an antelope in Wyoming down to exhaustion himself to show the community that an animal could be caught by foot. Unfortunately, Carrier failed miserably despite being a decent long distance runner and questioned whether long distance running was enough to catch a large animal. The antelope that Carrier had been chasing ran a bit fast during short distances and then it stopped to take breaks. During the breaks, the antelope rotated with other antelope to confuse the hunter until it eventually disappeared within the bushes. The entire time and unknowingly, Carrier had been chasing a fresh group of antelope with lots of energy. It's no wonder the antelope never collapsed. Carrier learned that running an animal to exhaustion requires more than just chasing it for a long period of time. And this is an argument that Louis Liebenberg also agreed with in a book he wrote in 1990 called The Art of Tracking. In this book, Liebenberg details how tracking is used by Kalahari Desert hunter-gatherers to catch their prey. Persistence hunting is an art that requires a hunter to be a good tracker. Liebenberg argued that the intellectual abilities to perform sophisticated types of tracking are the same abilities that are used to perform modern physics and math. He therefore believes it is possible that our abilities to do science originated from the ability to solve hunting problems in the evolutionary past. As with everything, it may be a contributing factor in hominid brain evolution, but to what degree it is unknown. In The Art of Tracking, Liebenberg explained how tracking could have evolved in the evolutionary past. There are three levels of tracking that he calls simple, systematic, and speculative tracking. Simple tracking is a straightforward type of tracking technique where an individual, presumably an early hominid, followed easily visible footsteps on the ground of its prey. Over time, early hominids mastered the ability to follow animals through simple tracking and thus became good at tracking them. Systematic tracking is a more sophisticated way of tracking an animal. Here, the tracker requires to have subtlety and perception. An individual needed to read the signs left from its prey, such as trampled grass or pebbles on the ground that had been displaced out of their sockets. From systematic tracking, early hominids probably developed speculative tracking, which is a technique that is even more involved than the two other tracking types. This type of tracking requires the hunter to imagine where the prey could have gone, but also requires knowledge of the animal and the terrain, such as knowing that a particular animal visits a certain feeding ground and where it rests on a regular basis. In a study done by Liebenberg in 2006, he found that persistence hunting produced about 70% more meat each day than huntsmen that utilized a bow and arrow to hunt animals down. 
but not as much meat as when hunting with dogs. But dogs had not been domesticated about 2 million years ago. This study showed that persistence hunting was probably a successful method of acquiring meat in the evolutionary past. Even though persistence hunting is not currently used widely or often, some groups of hunters such as the Kalahari Bushmen, the Tarahumara, the Navajo and the Australian Aborigines continue to use persistence hunting in spite of having other sophisticated tools available because it continues to be an effective way to acquire meat in some situations. Although persistence hunting is rare, the fact that some groups continue to practice persistence hunting sends a strong message that persistence hunting was probably a powerful way to hunt in the evolutionary past. <laughs>